Before we start the proceedings, let me acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work, and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Uh, my name is Ian McAllister from the School of Politics, and I have two distinguished speakers to introduce who are going to address us um, shortly. Our first speaker is Penny Lee, who's a democratic political and communication strategist with over 20 years of political experience. She's currently a senior advisor at Venn Strategies, a public affairs and government relations firm in Washington, D.C., and prior to that, she served as the top communications and political advisor to US Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. Over her career, she served as the executive director of the Democratic Governors Association, communications director for Pennsylvania Governor Edward Rindell, and as a member of the senior staff of the Democratic National Committee. Our second speaker is Noam Neusner, who's an experienced communications strategist, speechwriter, journalist, and author. And he's the founding principal of a company called 30 Point Strategies, which focuses on strategic communications, speech writing, and media relations. And prior to starting his own firm, he was President George W. Bush's primary speechwriter on domestic policy matters, including tax relief, Medicare reform, energy, and the environment. And he's also served as Director of Communications and Strategic Planning at the Office of Management and Budget. So the format of the proceedings for the next hour is each speaker will have about 10 minutes to talk about the campaign from their own perspective, and that should leave us about 40 minutes for a, a Q&A, and then we'll finish at 7 o'clock. So I'll hand over to Penny Lee to start. First, just let me say thank you, Professor, and to the university for hosting us here tonight. It's, um, we got here, uh, Noom and I got here last Sunday, and we've spent the last couple of days in Sydney, and now we are moving across the country. And I will say the level of interest on U.S. politics has, and especially this potential presidential race, has been astounding. Um, and it's actually quite humbling uh, when we go back to realize that we have not been following Australian uh, politics quite as much, but will now have a renewed sense uh, to be able to follow and be a little bit more conversant than we were when we first got here. Um, but so we appreciate uh, tremendously the amount of attention that folks have gotten, but also the, we had a, a, a session in, in Sydney with some high school students that were probably some of the toughest uh, questioners that we have found to date, uh, much more than even our harshest of media. Uh, they were quite well informed and I will say really challenged us on a, a lot of not only our own thoughts, but uh, kind of what was happening in the United States. So it was, it was quite <laughs> interesting, I will say. Noam got a little bit more of the brunt of it with her fascination with Donald Trump uh, so, than I did. But uh, needless to say, it was, it was quite uh, educational in our own right. Um, so I, I will speak, I come from the Democratic Party, uh, and so I will speak a little bit and just kind of scene set maybe for you. I'm sure you all, again, as, as watchers of the news and consumers of the news that you are, probably know just as much as I do, or if not more sometimes. Um, it just kind of maybe scene set a little bit of where the Democrats sit. Uh, as we've seen, uh, we are in a protracted uh, race where we have two, two, nom uh, two candidates uh, that are finishing out. We will end the race most likely on June 7th in, in California, will be the last primary. Uh, well, I would say that aside, that Dem the Washington, D.C. is actually the last primary, but there's only three votes, and uh, so it doesn't really count. But uh, uh, California will be the, la the last one in which we will really have a contested uh, primary, and, and that will most likely uh, be the end of that session. We are, uh, the two that are the for on the forefront uh, is Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders. And when you started the race uh, last year, it was kind of almost assumed, and it really was that the party was thought it was going to, you know, that it was assumed that it would be Hillary Clinton. Uh, it felt was felt by the party and, and many of them that it was her time, it was her turn. She had paid her dues in 2008, had won, had run an incredible campaign then, but lost, then served um, with uh, with great applause as Secretary of State. And it was just a natural uh, for her to then go and be to be the standard bearer for the Democratic Party. 
uh, but uh, it was also hoped upon that it would be contested because what we didn't want and what the, what the party does not want is just to feel that like it's a fait accompli, that it was just going to be assumed, that there was going to be a coordination, that it was just automatically going to be one person. And so, you know, you did have, you saw Jim Webb from Virginia get into the race, you saw Martin O'Malley from uh, Maryland get in the race, and then you saw a 74-year-old self-proclaimed socialist uh, from a state of about five people that uh, it was starting to garner the support of this youth movement. Uh, no one saw it really coming to the extent in which it, it has and is, uh, but it really has been a, a galvanizing and an energetic force within the party, both to not only uh, bring rise to many of the issues in which he is championing, both on an income inequality or, or access to education, access to health care, um, the way in which we uh, look at some of the economic imbalances. But it also, I would say, made both candidates better. Um, definitely, it has made Mrs. Clinton a, a, a better campaigner. Um, it has made her really sharpen uh, her own positions, her own point of views. And I would say, you know, barring anything um, spectacular, Mrs. Clinton will be the nominee for the Democratic Party. It's mathematically almost impossible for Bernie Sanders to, uh, to win the nomination, but everybody, you know, you know, different people have asked whether or not he should get out or he should pull out first or should he go ahead because it's mathematically or statistically impossible. He has 11 million contributors to his campaign right now. He has garnered tremendous amount of energy, and I really hope that he stays until the end to make sure that anybody in the states that haven't voted yet get the chance to voice their support. That is what the de democratic process is about, and I'm wanting to make sure and ensure that everybody that wants to can and will participate in the election, so, or especially in the primary setting. So, you know, Indiana saw a win for Bernie Sanders, and most likely the next three states, which are Nebraska, Oregon, and Washington State, most likely also will go to Bernie Sanders. I think it's important to remember in 2008, Mrs. Clinton actually won seven out of the last nine uh, contests as well. So it's, it's a fully exhaustive system, and we hope that both uh, mount. I think there's some concern that makes sure that the that the that the some of the animosity that might be, be being displayed as as of recent days doesn't uh, spill itself over and run negative counter to either one of them. I think they've been able to keep through this primary session. A, a, a level of discourse that has been healthy and has been based on the issues rather than personalities, unlike some others in another uh, party that we have seen. Um, but, you know, so, you know, going into, and then after the election, or after the primary session, we will go into the general campaign. Uh, Republicans have secured their nominee uh, a little bit quicker than we were all expecting. Uh, we were also weren't quite maybe expecting who they decided upon, but I'll let Name speak to his qualities uh, or lack thereof. I'm not quite sure which one you want to might say. But then we'll go into the general. And I would say in scene setting the general election, there are some built advantages into for the Democratic Party or whoever is the Democratic nominee. And in three distinct areas, one uh, being in just the sheer math uh, of the United States and where the votes come from. As you all uh, most likely know, uh, our system is not one in which whoever wins the most votes wins the presidency. And we have an electoral college um, in which you have to, based on whatever state you win, you know, garner the amount of electoral college votes. The magic number is 270. Uh, for someone to win the presidency, you have to win 270 votes. If you look at the last several elections since 1992 and consistently look, Democrats have consistently won 19 of those states. And out of those 19, 19 states, it garners to about 242 electoral, electoral college votes. Republicans under that same time period since 1992 have consistently won 13 states. Their electoral college out of those 13 states is 102 much different. You have Democrats at two, start out the race with 242. They need to pick up one more state, such as Florida, and it's over. They have their 270. Republicans start at a deficit of 102. 
So that is a built advantage in for the Democrats. Second built in, in, uh, advantage is the rising, what we call the rising American electorate. Our country has changed demographically. It has become less white, it has become more youthful, and it also has, it, the women vote has also increased election after election. Those three categories, uh, non-white, meaning African American, Hispanic, Asian, uh, women vote, and now the youth, have gone disproportionately for Democrats. If you take the 2012 race and you look at Mitt Romney and how he performed against Barack Obama, he lost the Asian vote by 42%. He lost the African American by over 50%. He lost the Hispanic vote by almost 48 points. He lost the unmarried women, which is a key demographic for Democrats, unmarried women by over 45%. He won married women, but only by 12. So that marriage gap in and of itself was over 30 points. So those demographic shifts and changes, and then the youth vote was overwhelmingly for Barack Obama. Those demographic changes and are only increasing as far as those electorate bodies is only increasing, they're consistently going uh, towards the Democrats. And if you have a nominee that looks like the Republicans are going to put forth, it really challenges that demographic math uh, when you have the potential insults that are being hurled uh, by, by the candidate of their choice. The third built advantage is traditionally Americans vote or have a large part of or is how they're feeling how they're feeling about their current incumbent president and how they're feeling about the direction of the, com of the country, economically in particular. Right now, you're starting to see Barack Obama for the first time in several years has actually gone above 50% approval rating. This will bode well for the incumbent party. Also, you're starting to see trend lines in which the, their feelings towards the economy, right track, right, wrong track of the country, is also starting to be into a positive com column. So those three things, I would say, in particular, really set the stage well for a Democratic nominee. But as we've seen, this is not a usual election. Um, there are you know, differences. I mean, first, first of all, Democrats are most likely to nominate for the first time a credible woman candidate. That has a factor. Republicans have are potentially nominating someone that has, a, you know, a, you could say has, has never served office, is a, is a reality TV star um, that has found his way onto the national stage with very colorful languages and 141 characters of insults on a daily basis or hourly basis. So he's a very different, uh, he appeals to a different electorate. He is likely to challenge that map that I talked about in a very different and dynamic way. His appeal with blue collar workers um, is, is something that will put some certain states, especially in, in our Middle West and our manufacturing states, such as Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, those kind of states in a very different, uh, could potentially be in a very different realm. I would say we would have to counter that with our southern states, which are a little bit more diverse. So it's going to be an interesting race. Nothing, uh, even with all of the advantages that I say we have on a statistical and in a scientific way going forward, uh, we are in for six months of, of, I think, a discourse that we've never seen before. And we do not know how it's going to outcome. We have two candidates that are at the top uh, with Donald Trump and, and Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump has right now a 68% unfavorability rating, but Mrs. Clinton has a 55% unfavorable rating. So these are not terribly popular people <laughs> in our country. And those dynamics do p come into play, whether or not people show up and participate, whether or not there's just a disdain for the entire system, whether or not you know, the, you're choosing you know, the lesser of two evils, as it, as it might be, and how that comes into play. So things look good, but we have still the art of the campaigning, which is personalities and you know, elements that come into play that we aren't expecting, whether it be an a, a issue on, on foreign soil or an economic crisis or other things like that. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Noam, but I would just say we are, we are positive about uh, where we sit. 
um, but realize that there is still six more months. Unfortunately, I wish we had the 73 days. It looks like you guys are going to get. Uh, trust me, America wishes they had 73, only 73, 73 days of this, because I think right now they're about listening to Sesame Street and ESPN uh, trying to get themselves out of the political discourse that has already taken place. Yes, thank you. The, um, the, it, it, for sure, especially... Uh, uh, Seeing up close your political system, um, the, the the speed with which you 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 can you have your elections is, is a huge plus, I, and I can say that that if I could fast forward to the next six months myself, I would really gladly do it, um, uh, because it's really going to be a very difficult time for uh, many Republicans, um, you know, uh, people who have have made a home in the party, uh, who have. You know, growing up within the party, you know, I, I wore Reagan Bush uh, pins in high school, which made me a bit of an outlier at the time, um, in, at least in high school. Um, but the the uh, uh, now you're seeing, I think, um, uh, within the Republican Party, a very um, significant civil war uh, occurring, um, and the first few battles have been won by by one side of the, the party. Uh, or people who have not traditionally been within the party. Um, I want to step back a bit and, and observe that, that what you should expect out of the U.S. in the next six months will be very emotional, very personal, um, very vindictive politics. Um, politics that I think, you know, in any democracy you're going to have from time to time. This is going to be particularly uh, a tough time. Um, whether or not you're with uh, Hillary or with Mr. Trump or against both of them, um, you're you're going to be subject to a lot of verbal abuse uh, from your you know people with whom you disagree. Um, you know it's interesting the the issues you know we're not in the United States. I mean we are always working on very important issues and you know being a great power you you, you know uh, the leadership of that great power conveys significant uh, responsibilities. Um, but it's not. We're not. We're not um, having this election at a time when there there are uh, particularly hot button issues that are really at work. Um, you know. So so the outcome of the election may or may not be substantive, um, but the 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 fact of the election is going to be substantive. It's going to really drive the country uh, into a deep ravine, um, which you know I I mentioned this because I think one thing we. we we do get from Australians all the time is deep concern about whether America is paying attention to the world, right? Whether we're 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 observing uh, what is happening, let's say, in the Pacific Rim or in Europe or in Africa, um, you know. And we have uh, responsibilities around the world, and and um, we seem to be um, kind of stuck in our own business right now. That's problematic. Um, you know the the um, the to understand the Republican Party, if, especially you know even if you're a close student of American politics, the Republican Party is is often misunderstood, uh, and and uh, especially by people who don't really observe you know live within it. Um, you know one of the, one of the great weaknesses of of um, of people who who study American politics is is if they don't really get to know the Republican Party and its many facets, they, they often misunderstand it and misconstrue it. Uh, so allow me to do a little bit of an anthropological uh, introduction to, the, to the, the, the family of the Republican Party uh, for, for your benefit. And, and the best metaphor I can give for, you, for this is, is basically it's like a house with four rooms. Um, and each room is, is, is populated by one major faction of the Republican Party. Or as a friend of mine, a fellow named Henry Olson calls it, one of the faces, the four faces of the Republican Party. Uh, so first room is, is um, let's say it's the dining room. It's uh, the evangelicals. These are um, social conservatives, um, you know, uh, people who are uh, deeply faithful, uh, often uh, Christian. Um, they, they are uh, all over the country. They're not just in the Deep South. Um, they can they com compromise roughly 45 million Americans. Um, they're a very significant base of, of, um, of political strength for the Republican Party. Um, they roughly number about 25% of the Republican electorate. Uh, and they're very important in certain states, but they're important everywhere. 
Um, and um, interestingly, they had, you would have predicted that they would have gone with Ted Cruz, the senator from Texas, but they did not. Uh, they actually went with Trump. Um, then you've got the fiscal conservatives. And the fiscal conservatives are, um, I, I, I feel most comfortable with that, that room. Uh, let's say that's the study. And, and these, are, uh, these are folks who are interested in tax issues, spending issues, you know, whether we run deficits in the hundreds of billions of dollars into the, into the future or not, whether we make promises to our, to our own citizenry that we can't meet or not. Um, those are our animating issues. Uh, we're about 15% of the party. Uh, then there are the moderates. And moderates can be uh, broadly defined as, um, you know, basically they're just what it sounds like. Um, and they're best represented by the views of people like Mitt Romney or John McCain, um, most lately. Uh, and, you know, the, and it's not that they're not conservative, it's just they're not conservative all the time. Um, and, and they generally, on social issues in particular, are quite comfortable um, with a, with a center-centrist position. Um, the moderates have very quickly welcomed the uh, advent of gay marriage in the United States, for example. And uh, opposition to abortion on demand is not something that animates them. Um, but they do believe in, in, in governance, responsible governance, and generally um, they're pretty comfortable with the Republican agenda. And the final uh, fourth room is the, what they call somewhat conservatives. And I don't know why the somewhat is, they're, they're conservative, but, they, um, but they, they tend to be very focused on national security, anti-terror. Um, they, they generally affiliate with the social conservatives on social issues, but they're not uniformly there. And they're certainly, um, they're not motivated uh, in the sense that of, um, you get from evangelicals, the sense that, that America is sort of God's nation. That's, that's something that they wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, they, I think they're more um, emotionally attached to America's great documents, the Constitution, um, its Declaration of Independence, its special, uh, special place in American history and world history. Okay, so there's, there's four rooms in this house, and we generally get along pretty well. Uh, we have for many years, and uh, suddenly Mr. Trump has come along, and, and it's like he's dr like driving a mobile home, and he's pulled it right up into the backyard of this house, and all his people are in there, and they've and and they are they're just really excited to come on into the house and drink the wine and sit on the furniture and and just kind of make make themselves at home. And it's making the other people in the house a little uncomfortable. Uh, not all of them, uh, but, but a great uh, but some of them, uh, the fiscal conservatives and the somewhat conservatives in, the, in particular. Um, and so, and so it's, a, it's a very difficult situation uh, if you're a Republican, a uh, lifelong Republican, because um, you're not seeing in Mr. Trump conservative views. Uh, this is something that I think it's important to know that, you know, if you're thinking of Mr. Trump existing on a right-left axis in the traditional sense, you're making a huge mistake. Some of his views are, are pretty straightforward on the right side of the aisle, but some of them are actually much further to the left of Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton, in terms of trade. Uh, he, is, uh, he is pretty much a protectionist. He has been very clear about that. And if you, if you think that Donald Trump is interested in free trade, you're wrong. Um, yeah, America's engagement in the world, whether America should be involved militarily or in some kind of capacity of extending its strength. Uh, he has given a speech where he basically <laughs> he embraced a, a, a slogan that was uh, the isolationist slogan between World War I and World War II, America first. I mean, it, you know, you, you couldn't make it up if you were actually trying to, you know, bring, uh, bring America back to its position uh, of isolationism in between World War I and World War II. Donald Trump is your man. Um, these are not positions that are, are familiar to conservatives, for sure, nor to most Republicans. Um, and so this is going to be kind of tricky. Um, and there's going to be uh, real battles within the Republican Party on this account. Um, now, one would say that, that normally the, the candidate coming out of the nomination process should have a full head of steam behind him and should have the full support of the party behind him, and that would make him a, a strong candidate. Donald Trump doesn't have those things. And so therefore you would think, and, and I think it's safe to say that you would think that he's coming out of the nomination process wounded, um, that there will be a number of Republicans who will not vote for him, and they've declared so. Um, I haven't gone that far, but I, I'm not planning on voting for Donald Trump, and you know I don't stand alone. Um, so, so the question is, does he have a chance of winning? 
Um, first, the answer is yes, because he represents the, the candidate of, of one of two parties. So, you know, it's not quite a coin flip, but it could be a coin flip. I mean, you know, it's a 50-50 country, and if enough people vote for him, uh, he'll be the next president. Um, but more critically, I think uh, you have to remember that Donald Trump has beaten prediction and conventional thinking many, many times. I mean, nobody would have ever pr predicted that a guy who, who basically um, doesn't spend a whole lot of money on his campaign, um, doesn't do any micro-targeting, doesn't have professional campaign operatives running his campaign, doesn't really try to build an operation of any kind, uh, basically just gives a lot of interviews on cable news, does a lot of big rallies in stadiums and airport hangars, um, would, you know, that, that and, and he would just spend his time just kind of tweeting. I mean, nobody would, would have thought that this guy, this guy had a chance to win this election. Uh, and there he is. He's the one who beat all the campaigns that had, trust me, I worked for Jeb Bush, I, I know. And we had a really professional campaign. It looked great, you know. We had digital people and, and I was a speech writer and we had a great policy shop and we, had, we were organizing ourselves for the long haul and we didn't even get out of um, South Carolina. So, you know, um, do not uh, dismiss Mr. Trump just because, um, I'm, you know, the conventional approach is to, is to dismiss somebody with his weaknesses. Um, I think that, that um, if you are uh, trying to predict what will happen next, um, I still think that, that Secretary Clinton, once she wraps up the nomination, she will be a prohibitive favorite. Uh, I, I think the, the, you know, the odds makers put her at an 80% likelihood of winning the election. Uh, that's very, those are very high odds, uh, considering we're six months out and, and a lot can happen. Um, so I'm just going to give you the alternative um, uh, theory about why Mr. Mr. Trump could actually win. All right, so I already gave you one, which is that anything can happen. That's the kind of in, indefinite. So let me give you three or four more specific ways that, that Donald Trump can, can win. The first is, um, as Penny made, made reference, he, he's not a conventional Republican, and therefore he, uh, he, uh, he can draw from voters who have traditionally not voted for Republicans. That includes the poor uh, or the working class. Um, or people who are just sort of, who have given up on American politics um, or who never really gave, you know, cared about American politics, but they kind of like something about him. There's something about him that they like. They like the fact that he's an outsider. They like the fact that he is uh, quite comfortable speaking off the top of his head, um, that he doesn't observe the laws of political correctness in any way. Um, he's, he actually doesn't mind offending people uh, deeply personally and saying, hey, deal with it, buddy. Um, and there's something that, uh, you know, that certain Americans just find refreshing about that. And, um, and that may bother you, it bothers me, but it, the, that's just the way it is. You gotta get used to that point. Um, there are other things too. Um, you know, he, he could benefit significantly if, if um, let's say there's a terror attack uh, in the United States or elsewhere. Uh, you know, Donald Trump rose significantly in the polls after the attacks in Paris. And I think it's worth noting that, you know, external events have a way of affecting American politics in a way that can't be predicted. Um, the 2008 financial crisis was what really propelled uh, Barack Obama to the lead in the polls. I mean, it was pretty close. He was, a, he was mildly ahead of Mr. McCain, but then after that it was all over. And that was partly because of the way Senator Obama dealt with it, and the part of the way that Senator McCain dealt with it, um, the American people were not reassured by Senator McCain, whereas they were reassured by uh, Senator Obama. Um, external events could also include, you know, sudden economic downturn, um, and also importantly, that Secretary Clinton is is still waiting to hear whether she's going to be indicted uh, by the F, uh, by the Department of Justice for the way she um, she organized her and and maintained her email in a private servers um, while she was Secretary of State. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a possibility. Um, I don't know whether that's likely to happen, but either way, that, that event um, will play out. Either she will be indicted or she won't, and, and Trump supporters will actually take comfort in either outcome. It will, it will, you know, if she is indicted, it will be, it will be impossible for her to run for office. Uh, if, if she's not indicted, it will further confirm their view that the system is corrupt and, and, and it serves the right, you know, the interests of insiders entirely. It's one of those heads you win, heads I win, tails you lose situations. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I want to wrap just by saying, you know, that these are possibilities. And, and I've, you know, as, as somebody who thought confidently that Mr. Trump would be knocked out of the primary process, I probably said it aloud, you know, 15, 20 times to my, to my Democratic wife who is, who is, you know, I mean, literally in tears in some of, the, some of the moments during the campaign. I was like, no, it won't happen, it won't happen. Well, here it is. Here it is, and so and so I've learned uh, to to no longer trust my political instincts uh, because they're so wrong. Um, <laughs> but um, um, but I still feel that that you know that there's that this is now a general election. This is no longer a primary. And and Penny and I have have, have you know we've looked at the numbers. I mean. The Republican primary and the Democratic primary are are votes of a sub a subsection of a subsection of the population, um, and and uh, it takes a lot to go to a, a caucus meeting in Iowa in in January. Uh, it takes a, a certain committed individual. Um, you here live in you know a fairly moderate environment, and you know the weather outside is beautiful and it's really terrific. I urge you to come to Iowa in the middle of winter time and and see whether you'd be so motivated to get out of your living room. You guys might, you're accustomed to it, but uh, a lot of people don't. And a lot of people do not participate in the political process, which is a shame, um, but it's particularly a shame because it leaves the political process in the hands of highly motivated people with strong views. Highly motivated with people with strong views often are, are terrific people to have dinner with, uh, but then they, they sometimes hand you a candidate that you simply did not expect or want. And, and I, I fear that's what's happened uh, in this election cycle. So I guess we're going to take some questions now, correct? Okay. Uh, thank you to both speakers. It's been really informative. Uh, so I think you've been both very frank that both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are turning to the general election in November now. I was interested. Uh, to hear your insights on who do you think will be on the short list for running mate for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, respectively. Thank you. Yeah. Yours is more interesting. Yeah. You know, some better names. Well, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, it, you know, it's kind of one of those, those processes that you can overthink it, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it really comes down to who the person likes, who they feel is going to be loyal, and who they feel can actually serve in the role in case anything was to happen and they could actually step in and be uh, President of the United States. You know, Mrs. Clinton is going, Secretary Clinton, I know, and I'm not sure, I'm not as close with uh, Secretary Sanders, but I do know that Secretary Clinton is going through the exercise right now, and they are meeting and they are looking and they are you know, taking a wide, wide cast. Uh, to to see who who might be the right fit, and you know sometimes you just overanalyze. Well, if I'm if I'm male, then I need a female. If I'm black, then I need somebody white. If I'm from the north, then I need somebody from the south. You know, all of these different issues come in, come into play. Some of the names that are out there, uh, you have Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia. Uh, he's a former he's a senator, a former governor, former mayor, former chairman of the party. Uh, he's more of a moderate, but he has also have a, he has a strong focus and a strong point of view on foreign affairs matters. You have Sherrod Brown, a senator from Ohio, uh, someone who came from the labor part, I would say, of the party. Uh, he's you know, obviously in a key state of Ohio. Uh, then you have uh, Senator Cory Booker, an African-American rising star, young, 40-year-old, uh, former mayor from Newark, New Jersey. Uh, again, a key state, critical, but also representing kind of the youth movement uh, of the party or of the country. And then you also have the real darling of the Democratic progressives, and that's Elizabeth Warren, uh, a former Harvard professor, a current senator from uh, Massachusetts. I would say um, she is a great and, uh, great and wonderful person. I'm not sure we need two historical candidates <laughs> on the same election. I think it's going to be tough enough to elect one woman, let alone two. Uh, but I think you know what's going to be what's, what will also be key, key uh, for the Democrats to unite. If it is Mrs. Clinton, is she is going to have to give rise, and she is going to have to give uh, you know to the progressive part of the party either. The issues in the platform, bringing uh, Bernie Sanders people into the into her camp, you know, potentially 
forecasting that the Senator Elizabeth Warren could serve in her cabinet or something like that. So there is going to have to be some give and take, especially on the progressive side. But as far as, um, look, right now everybody's on the short list. Um, and the greatest thing in Washington right now is to be rumored to be. In <laughs> fact, some even plant it themselves, uh, potentially having their own PR teams as to that they're on the short list. Um, but as they often say, uh, those who know don't say, and those who say don't know. So right now it's really in an exploratory side. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue with trying to pro project this with Donald Trump is, is like anything else with Donald Trump. Um, he is unpredictable. And um, you know, he'll probably announce it in, in a tweet. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, you know, there's really no serious short list uh, you know, right now. Um, I think there probably are some people who, who would like to be considered. Uh, Chris Christie, who was briefly a candidate, the governor of New Jersey, he threw his weight behind um, Mr. Trump and, uh, sorry for the pun there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I don't know whether he, whether he brings anything to, to I mean, look, I mean, here's the thing with, with Donald Trump. I mean, he's, he's somebody who is a singular figure. He has to be, he has to be alone in the spotlight. He cannot you know, it, it's kind of like Voldemort. I mean, he and Harry, can't, <laughs> Harry, Harry Potter can't coexist in the same universe. Right? He can't have somebody else sort of sealing his light. So, so he, he needs to, um, I, by the way, I love that. The headline's going to be, you know, Republican compares Trump to Voldemort. <laughs> uh, I should know better than that. <laughs> anyway, the, the, look, tr you know, Trump really needs somebody who can probably appeal to women. I mean, you know, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm giving him serious advice, which he probably wouldn't take, um, I would say, do, see if you can get somebody who appeals to Republican women. Not Democratic women, they're not going to vote for him, but, but at least Republican women, because if you, if you don't get them to come to the polls. So they, I just saw an article today about this um, a senator named Joni Ernst from Iowa, which is actually an important state. Um, that she would be a good candidate for him. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I know people who know her. I could probably run that up the flagpole and have it shot down pretty fast. Uh, so we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised if he just chooses somebody who's never held elected office because he figures, you know, hey, it worked for me. Let it work for somebody else, you know. Hi. Well, thanks. That was a great presentation from both of you. Thank you both. Um, a question going to Trump's campaigning style. Um, sorry. This Echo. Um, when we talked about the Democrats' campaign machine, we saw it in the last election. This, you know, really tight use of data and um, advanced digital campaigning techniques and all that. And you've got Trump now with his freewheeling style of whatever mm -hmm. that campaigning is, mm -hmm. relying on um, big media coverage, which perhaps works with particular segments of the population. But in a general election, where he's got to. Uh, appeal to different segments of voters and you've already alluded to his perhaps inability to take advice so for the Republican campaign machine to be able to engage him how do you think he's likely to run a campaign and what what sort of impact in the Republican Party is that likely to have? I mean you know I, I think he he's likely to stick with what has worked for him which is big broad bold relying, he's going to hope to rely on continued free media attention. I mean, his, his, the value of the free time that he got from cable news in the primary process has been put at $2 billion. So it would have cost $2 billion to advertise the time that he spent on, on air, uh, which is an, a, an astronomical amount of money. I mean, because when you see all the advertising, advertisements, and, you know, come September, October, November, you think that that's, you know, two billion dollars would buy a lot more of that. Um, I don't know, I mean, it depends whether, you know, it's interesting whether the Republican Party, you know, invests in that kind of micro-targeting effort. I just find, I, like, I don't understand what the micro-targeting would be. I mean, Trump's, you know, appeal is not a micro-target appeal. He's not gonna, like, fine-tune the message. I, that's actually part of his, part of his appeal is that he doesn't care how people hear his message. He's like, hey, look, look at what I'm saying, deal with it. And so I suspect that he'll, um, that he'll probably stick with his approach, which is big, broad, megaphone type stuff. Um, his advertising will, will probably have big themes that are largely um, in sort of not specific, non-specific. You know, he's not gonna offer big 
specific policy agenda. So, also. Thanks for your um, talks. Um, a few uh, nights ago, the US ambassador highlighted that um, the future of America, which matters so much to us as Australians, hinges to quite a large extent on the composition of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And there was a recent death there. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> I understand that President Obama has nominated a replacement, but uh, I don't know the status of that. It seems to be going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether the speakers could comment on the significance of the role of the Supreme Court in American society for us. Yeah, it, it, the ambassador is absolutely correct. Right now we do have a vacancy on the court uh, so we are in essentially a 4-4, we have nine members that serve on the Supreme Court, and we're essentially in a 4-4 tie, uh, four conservatives, four more uh, liberal. If the cases that come, come forth uh, end in a tie, the uh, lower court is just stayed, so the decision is just, is just left. There are tremendous amount of decisions that the court uh, has before them, whether it be on access to health care and women's health care in particular, in particular the issue of a choice issue or, or, or abortion. Immigration issue is also coming through. And also the, on the Republican side, they would say there being the, many of President Obama's executive orders are now being challenged as well through the court system, and they are going to be coming to rise to the Supreme Court. This is an issue, especially the balance of the court, especially for women in particular, uh, this is a galvanizing voting issue for them, um, mainly because a lot of times over the, of the, of the, of the health care and the reproductive rights issue is one that is always tenuous depending on the nature of the court or the balance of the court. So right now there is an opening. It's seen as the conservative slot. Um, president Obama has nominated in our system. The president nominates and then the Senate advises and consents, uh, meaning they vote yes or no. Uh, before President, I mean, almost to the day, I mean, within hours of Justice Scalia dying, uh, the Republicans had already made it known that they will not entertain any nomination or any even vote. They will not even entertain a hearing. They will not entertain a meeting. They will not entertain anything until the election is over. In their own words, they keep they continue to say that uh, we want the voters to decide irregardless or irrespective of the fact that the voters have decided in electing President Barack Obama and they elected their own as their own senators. Uh, so, you know, the logic it seems completely illogical to me, but uh, the longest prior to this time that we've ever had a vacancy is 72 days. We are now looking at almost 11 months in which you're, we are going to have a vacancy. And not only do we have a current vacancy, but we have two uh, Supreme Court justices more on the left side that have both indicated that they would most likely retire during this next uh, whoever serves next. So it is a paramount and it is something that will resonate more with single issue voters, mainly with women and certain either uh, persuasion of an LBGT community because there are rights um, on civil rights and other issues, voting rights. So, you know, how you slice and where it means in your status, I, I would say, has more paramount, but uh, it is definitely an issue that both sides will be raising. Yeah, the, the, uh, the politics, the political, the politicization of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court nomination process is, is now many decades old. Um, uh, it really dates back to, to the, the attempted nomination of Robert Bork under President Reagan in 1987. Uh, and it's it, it, each successive nomination process, uh, the the opposition party has has tried to uh, make it difficult for the president to name somebody a jurist who who is accomplished, uh, but also clearly of a certain persuasion. Um, and and there have been many things that have been said, and I can and 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 I I, uh, I, I think Penny has summarized it well although from her point of view. But one thing that we, we know is that if you want to find somebody to support your point of view from a prior nomination process, you can. Which is to say, if I wanted to justify how the Republicans are handling this particular uh, process, I could find a Democrat who said exactly what Republicans are saying right now under a previous administration. You mean the vice president? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't going to say, but there it is. Um, so, so 
and, that, and, and that is extremely troubling, and it is a problem for the for our for an important part of our of our government. Here's the thing to think about, and Penny already alluded to it. Um, it is actually the issue that could generate a significant amount of turnout for this um, for either candidate. Um, you know, typically, uh, you know, it's true that that um, certain certain issues that could become uh, could become before the Supreme Court generate a lot of interest and enthusiasm, political enthusiasm among uh, affected groups, affected populations. Uh, this, I, the only, I mean, that's interesting, the, the, among conservatives who do not like Trump, the most compelling argument to get, to get them to the polls will be, yeah, you don't like him, but if you don't vote for him, then those three at least one, and probably as many as three Supreme Court seats will be decided by Hillary Clinton, and not by somebody who we hope will, you know, put up people that we like. So, surprisingly, this actually might might be um, it might generate a lot of activity, separate and apart from feelings about the, the candidates themselves. Um, I guess observing that um, certainly uh, the approval rating for Congress, I think last time I checked it, crawled all the way up to 9% across the channel. Seven. Seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, no, was it seven? I saw it up to nine the other oh, day. And oh, I was oh wow. Brilliant. They're, the they're right really direction. going strong yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and out of the 535 members, all but I think two, one of them being Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. are Democrat or Republican. I, and there's other polling and uh, evidence that both the Democratic and Republican brands are quite toxic. Yeah. And you've seen candidates from McCain calling himself, you know, the Maverick and things, trying to distance themselves from those brands. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is a presumptive race between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you've got one who is not anointed by the party at all and one who very much is. Mm. And how will that play out and how will the strategies and tactics of uh, depicting one as a genuine independent, not really part of any of those parties, and one who is the image of a party yeah. player uh, play out in the election? It, it's really, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant question that you're asking. And, you know, it's, while uh, the, the Democrat brand might be suffering, Mrs. Clinton is, is well-liked within that brand. Uh, she probably enjoys right now probably about a 75% approval rating amongst Democrats. So she is beloved, and that is going to be the key: is whether or not you can turn out uh, this, the amount of Democrats needed to propel her. So, you know, she does suffer um, from an establishment brand. Being, you know, I don't think she can run away from her last name, nor will she. Um, her, her husband was president of the United States. She has been in this public arena for many, many years, unlike her counterpart, and he is going to use that as a as a weapon you know, against her. It's one of the few times, you know, it's so interesting, especially going through this primary process, where experience is actually a deficit. Uh, you know, you, you usually go in for a job interview, and people want to know how much experience you have, and are you qualified to serve? And in this one, now it's a liability. You know, oh my goodness, you know, they know too much, or they, they have too much experience. They've been in Washington way too long, and the system is now, you know, taken a part of them. So it's a very interesting, it will be, a dynamic, but I have to believe um, because because you do see it in the polling and the, and the strength of her numbers is that experience is her number one reason to vote for her on both sides, and people do respect the fact that look, the president of the United States, the commander is the commander in chief, and there are issues that are arising around the world, and to jeopardize that or put that at risk. For someone who is rogue, who says such crazy things that the Chinese are rapists and Mexicans just all are coming across our borders to kill our individuals, and we're going to carpet bomb Iraq, and you know we're going to turn over our policy of Syria into for, to Putin, and you know all of those. You know there is at some point I have to believe the seriousness of the moment and the seriousness of the issues will really put the stark contrast, and that point of experience will be actually a galvanizing reason to vote for Mrs. Clinton. Yeah, well, I, I, first of all, I love your T-shirt, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a T-shirt of Abraham Lincoln uh, with a parakeet on his shoulder with, a, with an eye patch. I guess it's Pirate, a, Pirate Abraham? Is that the deal? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice way to freshen up the Republican brand. I yeah. <laughs> we should try that. Um, no, but that's exactly, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think that, you know, analytically, if I were, uh, if I were Donald Trump, I would, 
be absolutely hammering away at Hillary Clinton for all the 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 all the all the sins that are perceived to come along with having spent you know the last 25 years pretty much in Washington D.C. and um, you know and she she also sits at this sort of this uh, this power center you know of foundations and corporations and Wall Street and you know the Democratic elite and she has a lot of you know even Republican friends are so you know like if Republican donors start donating to her that. That, that, that money comes with huge strings attached from Trump's point of view. He's going to hammer her on it. Um, so, you know, that could be a very effective and powerful message. And I'm telling you, there, you know, so many people hate what goes on in Washington, Democratic and Republican, that Trump's, Trump you know, would be very smart to basically be spending a lot of time talking, about, talking to the Sanders voters and saying, you've been had. You know, you've been had. You were shafted. You you thought that you could you could cast your vote for a pro, you know for a candidate who really represented your point of view. Ah, the Clintons had it all. The fix was in, and and they, he'll say that. And and the question is whether the Sanders people, you know, hear something and, and maybe they, I I can't see it, <laughs> but but I but the question is whether they stay home. If they stay home, that's that's going to be tough for her. Um, thank you for that. I'm um, just building off what you were just saying. Um, we've seen Bernie Sanders recently making this argument that um, he is a better candidate against Donald Trump and some of the things that have been said tonight, you know, talking about some of the positions Donald Trump has on the left um, and Hillary's history. Um, is it possible that um, Bernie has a case here? Can Donald Trump hit her from the right and the left as an establishment figure while he's an outsider, whereas, you know, maybe Bernie it's going to be much harder to hit from the left, definitely. Um, he has been railing against the establishment since the 1800s. So, yeah. um, yes, exactly. Is that a, realist, a realistic argument for Bernie to make? Or when it comes to you know, the, the general election and the bulk of Amer Americans, is the argument that Hillary is the centrist candidate that most people will um, you know, fall in behind a, a better perspective? It's, it's a strong argument for Bernie to make. Uh, you know, as far as his position, but I think what he fails to also state in there, America, the writ large general, is not ready to have their taxes increased to such a level that would actually pay for free health care, free college tuition. I mean, we don't have the luxury that you all have here. We just, the, the mindset of America is not there. And so his policies, and I just, we are not a socialistic society, and he, what he is proposing, A, hasn't been thought out, even when he was questioned, you know, time and time again, either through the, through the editorial boards and the newspapers and other, he actually doesn't have a really good answer um, to some of the proposals in which he do. So it's more in the ideal, and the ideal is really nice, but it, it, it won't stand through the test, especially in a general election scrutiny. It just, it just won't. But he does have a point. Um, <laughs> on the fact that yes, she is, she is part of the establishment, you know, and she's gonna have to broaden her appeal to break, make sure she does bring in those progressives. You know, right now, you know, it, it's difficult. I mean, her experience, like I said, is a little bit of a liability in that she knows, you know, we're not gonna go to these grandiose plans. We don't have the Congress that's willing to like take, a, you know, take them aboard. I mean, trust me, you know, if President Obama could have gotten through universal health care, free health care for all, Trust me, he had 60, he had the majority, the super majority in the Congress to get it done and they couldn't even get it done. So when you have a divided Congress and someone who is outside the mainstream, it's really not going to get done. So she, you know, unfortunately, she has the experience to know the changes are going to come incrementally, but that doesn't sound really good on this stump. That doesn't really sound inspirational and aspirational. And so she is kind of hampered by that own experience. She knows what it actually takes to govern. Um, you know, Governor Cuomo from New York used to say you, you uh, campaign in poetry and you govern in prose, but she kind of campaigns in prose as well. And uh, so, you, you know, it, that is a challenge to her and to her own candidacy, and it will be a challenge going into the poll. You know, you, you, you raise an interesting point, um, and you, it's a perceptive one, which is that the, the, that the, the protest vote on the Democratic uh, side is, is for Sanders. And it's a meaningful size of the, of the electorate, and it's uh, extremely 
to the left of, of, of where the Democratic Party, it's to the left of where the Democratic Party has been. Uh, meanwhile, you've got, um, you're coming off of eight years of Barack Obama's uh, administration, which, you know, if you're a, a liberal in the United States um, and you're, you're dissatisfied uh, with the amount of liberal policies that you got out of him, I think you're delusional. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I can tell you that as a conservative, I am chagrined uh, and really upset, really, that, you know, some of the policies that he put into place, I think they're bad for the country. Um, so I don't see any reason why liberals should be feeling like they have a lot of unfinished business. Well, <laughs> evidently they do. Uh, and what's actually it's striking is because that... Because you keep blocking it. Right, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> trust me. It's a good reason for it. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the uh, meanwhile, Mr. Trump... Is, is has won the Republican nomination uh, without uh, you know without meaningful opposition to policies that you know, ideas that are truly from the left. I mean protectionism, uh, protectionism of not only of markets but also of labor markets. I mean an anti-immigration policy is in effect a, a a a protection of the labor market, and it's you know and by the way it's not surprising that unions have traditionally been anti-immigrant in the United States. Uh, and actually remain so in many respects, in fundamental respects. Um, you know, you, Trump is running to the left of the Republican Party and has won the nomination. Bernie Sanders ran to the left of the Democratic Party and nearly won the nomination. This is after eight years of Barack Obama running, you know, running the country on the left side of the aisle. Looking at this as a conservative Republican, all I can say is, this is really a bad signal to me. I mean, this is really bad. It, mean, it means that, that, that the ideas that I, want, that I hold to be, to be true and to be preferable are completely out of fashion in the country. Um, and this is why re Republicans have to get over the whole nostalgia over Reagan. Um, this is really important. I mean, you know, for what it's worth, you know, whether or not you liked Reagan, um, he, he was a very effective uh, politician, very effective leader. He got a lot of stuff done. Yeah, but that was 1980 to 1988. Country has changed. Circumstances have changed. We can't keep rolling out the same ideas and expect the same kind of response. And this is, a ver this is part of the civil war that's coming within the Republican Party. So we have to become a party of ideas again. We used to have a lot of ideas. We used to bring forward lots of ideas, and, and, and a great deal of them were put into policy. Welfare reform was a Republican idea. Bill Clinton, you know, eventually got a board on it, and it, and it worked. Um, so, so we we have to you know regenerate ourselves ideologically, and it's not just about you know whose camp is going to be politically in power. Um, my question is addressed to Mr. Neusner. Um, let me say first of all, I think you're very brave admitting that you were a speechwriter for Jeb Bush. Um, <laughs> But my, my question is uh, directed towards the future of the Republican Party. Um, the remarkable thing about the election so far is that the Republican Party leadership has lost control completely over the most important decision that a political party in America makes, the choice of its leader. When this happened to the Democratic Party in 1972, when they elected a presidential candidate that the establishment, the Democratic Party establishment didn't want. The Democrats then eventually, a few years later, reformed the reforms, the party reforms, and created uh, the superdelegates to yeah. give a voice to the party leadership in the convention. Are the is the Republican Party likely to do something uh, similar after this train wreck, or do they have any ideas about how in future years the Republican Party leadership will exert some control over the selection of its party candidate. All right. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think they'll. Uh, I think there will be some. Um, there'll be some rethinking about the process. I mean, but one, one thing you you know, the Democrats will tell you this too is that you can you can write the, the rules any way you want, you can change the process any way you want, but something else happens and and then you have to write the rules again differently. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, you're constantly sort of fighting the last war. Um, it goes without saying, you know, that the process went in a direction that the Republican establishment, its elected leaders, uh, would not have expected or even wanted. Uh, I actually want to address your first comment, though, um, just because I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's important, important for you to realize 
Um, it, it's a great honor to, it was a great honor to work on Jeb's campaign. It was a great honor to work for George W. Bush. Um, you know, the, those of us who labor in, in, you know, in, in public service do, do so often at, at, great, um, uh, at great pain, you know, financially and, and socially. It's not easy. Um, I mean, it's a great honor, uh, but it's, it's, you know, you don't see your family, you know, it's, it's difficult work. Uh, so, you know, take care with your thoughts about that kind of thing. I, I you know, Jeb's a, Jeb's a great man. I think he would have been a great president. Uh, he, he obviously didn't catch on. Uh, George W., um, you know, I thought was a great, great one to work for. I think he was right on a lot of issues. I think history will, will prove him correct. Uh, you may disagree. That's okay. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned and, I've, I, and I try to practice this as much as I can with my, my friends who work in the Obama administration is, it's tough, it's hard. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, giant country. We have a $4 trillion budget on a $16 trillion economy, uh, 320 million people. It's never gonna be easy. Uh, it, always looks, uh, it always looks like you're making mistakes and it always feels like you are. So yeah, we try to get it right more than we don't, um, but, but uh, we, we, we do so with, uh, with the hope that at least our intentions are, are taken well. So I hope you'll, you'll consider that in the future. Well, we've run out of time, and I think you'll agree we've had a fascinating insight into what would appear to be an absolutely fascinating election. So thank you to <laughs> our two speakers. Thank you.